going above and beyond. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, no, I appreciated it. No, the um, <laughs> uh, we are we're continuing with his story, and uh, I, I really think that last song captures it. Um, it. It's that throughout his story, God was leading us to the cross. Um, no matter where you look, uh, no matter where you're at, Old Testament or New. Um, Matter of fact, at the top of my notes, I had some connections to the New Testament. If you want to see um, some commentary on what Moses and his life meant, if you look at Acts chapter 7, um, Stephen preaches. Uh, he speaks before the, the religious leaders of the day, and he talks about Moses. And uh, as a result, he was stoned to death. Um, next week, we're going to look at John chapter 2 and make those connections. Um, this is going to be that last one where we like try and cover 10 chapters at a time. You know, big story. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do if I do half a chapter next week. It may be a five-minute sermon. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> um, but just to review where we left off, this is right after the plague of the firstborn. Um, and something unprecedented happened. You know, Pharaoh, who was supposed to be the living God in his, amongst his people, gets up in the middle of the night and he goes to Moses. Um, and he says, go, get out of here. Um, and that's, that was the Passover. You know, this plague of the firstborn that prompted him to do that. <clears throat> there was a passing over of the people of Israel. So that plague of the firstborn, it illustrates the cost of sin. And it prefigures then God's sacrifice of his son. You know, the firstborn of Egypt died that night, but God's firstborn would die 2,000 years ago. And that Passover was a prefiguring of the passing over of our own sins. Uh, even though judgment fell on the Egyptians that night, the Israelites were passed over because of the blood of the Lamb over their doorstep. And so Exodus 12, 33 through 40, uh, it talks about the Egyptians. They were fearful at that point. So they basically are ready to drive Israelite, the Israelites out. So the Israelites take their goods, and they don't have time. They, their bread hasn't even risen, so they've got unleavened bread with them. But they leave with jewelry and with clothing because God has, um, has given them a good reputation amongst the Egyptian people. And because they're fearful, they actually hand over many of their possessions to the Israelites. And then finally in, in 12, 43 through 51, God basically institutes his Passover. He tells them that they are to remember this day. Um, so that's where we take up. And I, I titled the sermon Song of Moses, and it is. It's a big chunk of scripture that we're going to talk about. And it's basically, I think, broken down into five parts. They probably each one could have been a sermon. Sorry. Um, but right in the middle of it is this Song of Moses. You know, right in the middle of these five stories, Moses breaks into song. And we see things like that in scripture. We see it with um, Zechariah. We see it with Mary, where they break into song. And it's a fantastic summary of what God had done for the, uh, for the Israelites to that point and what he was going to do. But we'll start with the first of those main elements. Starting in 13, verse 1, basically remember this day. He tells them to consecrate their firstborn. He basically tells them to set them aside. You know, it's because that there's been this plague of the firstborn. And it's a reminder of you know, Abraham. He was ready to sacrifice the firstborn son of the covenant that God made with him. And God said, no, I'm going to bring the ram. It's a prefiguring then of his son and the sacrifice he makes. But Exodus 13.3 says, Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. And again, that's his covenant name. That's Yahweh's name. So remembrance is important. It, it's always been important for God's people. I've said it before. We remember every week at the table. We remember what God has done. Um, it's been important no matter when. Uh, all throughout scripture. And I dare say it's probably part of our design. You know, I think Adam and Eve forgot who they were for a moment and, and gave in to temptation. And we do the same thing. We forget we're claimed by the king. And sometimes we fall. Fortunately, we can repent and turn around and, and fix it in the blink of an eye because of the covenant we're under. But God says to remember, and he gives them seven days to celebrate uh, with the eating of unleavened bread. And that was the institution of one of the first of the, the Hebrew festivals. Um, Exodus 13, 8 goes on and says, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt. That's important. 
Remembrance isn't just for our generation either. Remembrance can be lost if we don't preserve it. Uh, basically, it's saying you've got a duty to pass on remembrance of the covenant. You shall tell your son on that day, and sons and daughters, we could say it that way, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it's very personal. Because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. How many of us tell our children that when we come to church, it's because of what God did for me? He died for my sins. How much more real does that make it for our children? And we're told to remember. We get to a little um, intellectual part here because God brings the point home. Um, I've talked about before in the Old Testament, there's uh, something called a chiasm. You know, when we make a, a point, we have a tendency, if we're writing an essay, we put the main point, we put the thesis up top, then we have our subpoints, and maybe we do a summary at the end. But they did it differently at times. If you were to outline it, they would make some of their points, make another point, another point, and then the main point is there in the middle. It's like the, the point on the, the, the key, the sort of the X letter. That's where the term comes from. If you were to cut it in half, that's the main point. And then it steps back out and it repeats those points that came before. So stepping into that, it says, and I shall <coughs> be, excuse me, it shall be as a sign to you on your hands as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord be in your mouth. And it goes on, for because with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. So it starts out saying that it will be a memorial for you. And then the second point, stepping in, is that because he has brought you out of Egypt. That's verse 13.9. Uh, so the third point stepping in is, you shall be set apart to the Lord, all, you shall set apart to the Lord all the first that opens the womb. Then in verse 14, it comes to the point, it says this, And when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. If we were to apply that to us today, it's by his strong hand, he brought us out from slavery to our own sins. God was leading us to a cross even then. And then to give the parallel, verse 12, it talked about setting aside all the first that opens the womb. But in verse 15, it says, Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all males that first open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. We set them aside for God. That was the idea for the, for the Israelites. In verse 9, again, when it was stepping in, it says, For because with a strong hand Yahweh has brought you out of Egypt. Uh, and, and 16, it's, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I missed it in this one. But it shall be as a sign on your hands, a memorial between your eyes, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. And then in 16, it says, It shall be as a mark on your hands and on the frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Those two points go together. That's where I got confused. But it will be on the frontlets. And if you know about the priestly garments, they actually had what they called a frontlet that was placed on their heads, and they carried verses. They carried scripture within that. Uh, it, it was something to be carried with them, to be remembered always. That by a strong hand, you brought us out of Egypt. So the second point, the second part is then God leading his people, okay? He institutes these remembrances, but then God leads his people. And, and God chose a path, and sometimes we miss this. He chose a path so that they could avoid war. He basically says, you know, we're going to avoid the Philistines because if y'all get into a war right now, you're going to become discouraged. You're going to run back to Egypt. So he takes another path. And then Exodus 13, 21, 22 says, And then Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. And the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. <coughs> So here he is. He's God in the midst of his people once again. That was, that was the original intent in Genesis. And here he is in their midst as a pillar of cloud and as a pillar of flame. And it says he did not depart from his people. So he continues to lead them. He, he gets them to a certain place. He tells them to camp between the city of Migdal 
and the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, depending on, on how you translate it. And in 14.4 it says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And we've run into this before, right? Pharaoh, he really had his chance. So God's just confirming what he's done. The choices he's made. And he hardens his heart because this is an important part of the story. And let's face it, even a very bad man is going to be intimidated by a column of flame and by a column of cloud. Think about the worst ones in history. They might not have done what they did had that been happening. So he hardens his heart. It says he took 600 chariots and took other chariots then and his officers. And in 1411, we're told that Israel is struck with fear. But Moses says to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which we, he will work today for you. And he tells Moses this. In verse 16, he says, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea. And again, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. But in 1417, he says, I will get glory over Pharaoh. And then in verse 18, he says, and the Egyptians, and he's talking about the people there, shall know that I am Yahweh, that I am the I am. So he hardens his heart, and he's going to bring judgment on Pharaoh. But even at the same time, even though he's delivering his own people, he's also speaking to the people of Egypt so that they'll know who he is. So the common people will know the oldest churches that we have. Some of them are in Egypt. The most persecuted as well. So in the next phase of the story, God delivers his people. 14, 19, and 20 say, Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh drove the sea back. And we sometimes miss this. They marched out at night. It says, In the morning watch, that would be between three and six, the Lord, Yahweh, in a pillar of fire and of cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And we hear this phrase repeated again. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, Yahweh threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. And we're told that none remain. So it's summarized in verse 30 and 31. Thus, Yahweh saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord had used against the Egyptians. So the people feared Yahweh and they believed in Yahweh and in his servant Moses. So the people saw and they believed. So we have this first episode, this great deliverance from Egypt. Deliverance from Pharaoh. Deliverance from uh, you know, basically the ruler of the known world at the time. And Moses breaks into song, like Zechariah, like, like Mary with her Magnificat. And it's Hebrew poetry. It's, it's written um, two verses at a time, and they usually are related to one another. Uh, but it's, it's, it's this beautiful song. And we can only focus on a few points. Uh, but there's no better summary. And it starts out, and it was our, our passage in here. It says, And Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My, Father God, and I will, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. We could, we could sing the same thing today. We could sing the exact same thing today. So it goes on. And I was actually going to, you know, you have to choose your moments. <laughs> it's a big passage. Um, I was going to leave this one alone. And uh, interestingly, um, I feel like this really has to do with God's feelings towards those who've, it's not just that they've chosen to go against him. It's not that they've chosen wrongly. It's that they've gone so far that they think it's okay to stand in others' way. That they think it's okay to lead others astray or, or destroy others. And, and that's where God's wrath comes in. But this, this part gets at it. Uh, verse 3, it goes on. It says, Yahweh is a man of war. 
and Yahweh is his name. I am is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The flood covered them. They went down into the depths like stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. I struggled with that idea about God. When I was younger, the idea of a God of fury, a God of wrath, until you realize that his fury and his wrath, it's zeal for his people. It's that he created people to, to live in his presence. He created these people, and he's calling them to himself, calling them to be sons and daughters, and there are people who stand in the way, who knowingly stand in the way, who knowingly say the wrong things, who knowingly persecute, who knowingly kill. And so that's where God's wrath comes in. So God's wrath is real. Evil is real. And the reason I picked that up and decided to share it today was on uh, Friday, I actually went to a, a faith leader's breakfast. And we were talking about a book called The Clergy Killers. It talks about the kinds of things that come at pastors and at churches and that um, sort of break down the fellowship of a body or break down people who serve God. And it describes people and actions as evil. And there were at least two people in that room who were uncomfortable with that. I'm uncomfortable with the word evil. Um, when it came down to it, they said they believed in evil actions, but not evil people. And that's not biblical. And you know, as a peacemaker, I, I talked to him a little bit about the difference between the way the word was used in scripture and the way sometimes it's used now. We're kind of frivolous. Maybe we have a Hollywood image of what evil is. But you know, there are Hitlers in the world. There are people out there who are, are genuinely evil. Biblically, it says so. And uh, I ran across a quote from a friend of mine. And it basically said, red flags look like normal flags if you're wearing rose-colored glasses. I don't know what the origins are. But if you're wearing rose-colored glasses, you don't see the threats. You don't see those things out there. We have enemies. Sometimes they make their way into the church. God reserves wrath for them. We may not know who they are, but we can pray that God stand against those enemies. We should never have rose-colored glasses. The battle is real, and God is zealous for us and to protect us. So they go on and he gives praise. And this, again, is something that we can take with us today. 1511 says, Who is like you, O Yahweh, O Lord among gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Who is like you? They, they establish this claim of, on the one true God. There are no others out there. No matter what the Canaanites claim, no matter what the Egyptians claimed about their Pharaoh, who was just struck down, you are the one true God. And we have remembrance and hope again. It says, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. God still guides his people in his steadfast, steadfast strength. He still guides them into his presence, into his holy abode. And that's our hope for the future. God hasn't changed. He's the same then, now, and always. In spite of our doubts, in spite of our weaknesses. So often we want to judge the Israelites when they grumble in the wilderness, and we'll talk about that. But how often do we do it too? And yet, God is steadfast in his love, and he still guides us. 14... Uh, yeah, 14 and 16, it talks about the fear of the nations, too. And we'll close out the song with that. Um, I think that that's still true. I think God still strikes fear in the nations. If you look at the world around us and how um, opposed to sometimes the thoughts, the ideas of Christianity, the world around us is, I think oftentimes it's because they fear it might be true. And that might be a reason for hope for us as well. Because if there's fear... There's a belief behind it, and maybe a, there's a chink in that armor where we can speak into the lives of some of those people who persecute our church. But he talks about striking fear in the nations. And fear causes all kinds of emotions. It causes anger. It causes hatred. And we see that poured out in this world. And it's still true. So Exodus 15, 17 through 18 gives us the future promise. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Yahweh will reign forever and ever.
So Moses' song is a sermon in itself. I could have just limited myself there, but we are getting through his story. So we come to a point where God provides for his people. They move on in their journey. They're headed towards a mountain. We've gone through the foothills. We've, we've made their ascent as they escaped from, uh, from Egypt. And, and they go, come to a place called Mara, and they're grumbling. They start grumbling again. We're thirsty. And the waters there are they're bitter. So he tells Moses to pick up a log, throw in the water. It makes them sweet again. And he declares himself their healer. In verse 26, um, let's see here. Give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, and I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. He declares himself healer just as he healed us from our sins. So their journey moves on and he takes them to the spring of Elam and then finally into, appropriately, the wilderness of sin. And we say sin is the, it means just missing the mark, like the archery term if you miss by too far, um, like we did in the gym the other day. <laughs> um, and they start grumbling. They, they start saying, we're hungry. I wish we were back in Egypt where our pots were full. And God foretells, though, his provision. Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to, f to the full, because Yahweh has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So in ver uh, verse 13 and 14 it says, In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. Uh, a later verse, that was verse 13 and 14, describes it as being like coriander seed, that it was white and that it tasted like wafers made of honey. And again, God comes to this point where he tells them to remember. So he's been providing for them in the wilderness. He's cleansed the waters. He's provided them with food. He's provided them with everything that they need. In 16, 32, and 33, says, Moses said, This is what Yahweh has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations, so that you may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. It was to be kept in God's presence. So he's going before them in a column of, of fire, in a column of, of cloud and of smoke. And he's foretelling this time where God will dwell in their presence in the tabernacle. And he's saying, put it in this jar. And you're going to put it in your presence. And we were actually uh, talking about the presence of God in, uh, um, in our Bible study today. And I wasn't exactly prepared. And, and Linda Maple came with verses about God's presence. Um, and, and we talked a little bit about the temple and the tabernacle and how God wished to dwell amongst his people. He says, place this remembrance in my midst. And then there's a poetic recitation in verse 35. It says, the people of Israel ate manna for 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate manna till they came to the border of the land at Canaan. And his final provision then was uh, water from a rock. That once again, they're, uh, they're grumbling, they're thirsty, and Moses says, why, why do you test the Lord? And he strikes the rock and he brings water from the rock. So God provides. We have an interlude before our, our final section, but uh, we come upon this point where Amalek, one of the kings, comes up against Israel, and they have to, to fight him, and you may remember that. It's where Moses is told to hold his staff on high, and as long as he does, he's going to defeat the Amalekites. And when he becomes tired and his arms go down, they start to win. And so Aaron and I think it was her, yes, held up his hands, and they defeated the Amalekites. I think there's a strong lesson to be learned there. In the midst of trouble, we should bear up one another's burdens. We should hold one another up, and we can accomplish what God calls us to do. But I wanted to look at this, uh, this interlude more for what it has to say about Jethro. You remember his father-in-law? His father-in-law was a priest of the nation of Midian. His father-in-law was not an Israelite. As a matter of fact, when he was coming back to, to Egypt, he was stopped short because his wife and his child were not Israelites. They hadn't come under the, under the covenant of Abraham. So they had to stop and they had to circumcise, circumcise his son. And Zipporah is the one who does it, calls him a bridegroom of blood. So now, in chapter 18, Jethro comes to greet them, and he brings Moses' wife and son with him. 
this priest of Midian, and he rejoices at what God has done. It says, And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that Yahweh had done in Israel. That was in 18 verse 9. And then he acknowledges Yahweh above all others. He says, Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all gods. And in verse 12 it says, And Jethro, Moses' father, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses, father-in-law, before God. So they all sat down and had a covenant meal. So we see now, all of a sudden, Moses' entire family has converted. They've become Israelites. They've come to, come to believe in the one true God. And wisdom comes from this man, Jethro. He gives him advice on sharing the burdens of leadership. He says, no, obey my voice and I will give you advice. And he tells him to present the laws that God will give him to the people. He tells him to bring the cases that the people bring before God, to ask God's judgment, and then he will bring judgment on the people. And then he tells him to appoint chiefs and let them judge in smaller matters. Um, it, it's one of the first instances where we realize God doesn't want just one person to speak for him. He wants many people to speak. So he appoints chiefs. He says, if you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure and all this people also will go to their place in peace. So finally, we're getting there. We get to the mountain of God. We've had the foothills, we've had the ascent, and now we reach the pinnacle. So on the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephaim. <clears throat> Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai and they encamped in the wilderness and Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God and Yahweh called out to him out of the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel. And what he has to say at this point, we've mentioned the covenant before. This is the first time. This is the big covenant pattern. It's a pattern you'll recognize. It's a pattern we'll talk about next week. It's what we're going to end on. But the first is he proposes his covenant. He says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore, on, bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandments, you shall be my treasured possession amongst all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Those are the words that Jethro says to bring to the people of Israel. In 19, 1 through 6, God proposes his covenant to the nation of Israel. In verse 8, we have their acceptance. So all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. So he tells them to prepare. He tells them to put on fresh clothes, bathe themselves, get clean. He gives them some provisions. Uh, he, he tells them basically only Moses is going to come up to the peak of the mountain. The rest of you are only going to come up so far around the base of the mountain. And we'll find out that there are some exceptions later. But basically he, he, he's setting boundaries about who's going to participate in the ceremony and about who are going to be witnesses. So we have a proposal, we have an acceptance, we have witnesses. And then in chapter 20 Again, could be its own sermon. We're not going to do it. We have the Ten Commandments. <laughs> um, if you're not aware of them, look them up. Chapter 20, 1 through 17. But they're known as stipulations. When there's a covenant, it's proposed, it's accepted, and then there are rules to the covenant. And so the Ten Commandments are the summary of what those rules are going to be. This is Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, and that you may not sin. So he gives them these commandments. And he places some fear on them so that they won't sin, so that they won't stray. It's for their own good. And then chapters 20, 21 and 23, we have an expansion of the laws. So we have the summary of the stipulations, and then we have a slight expansion of them over the next three uh, chapters. And then we come to chapter 24, verse 3. It says, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, all the rules, and all the people answered in one voice and said, all the words that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. So we have a recitation of these stipulations, these vows that they're making before their God, and then a presentation. In verses 7 and through 8, it says, Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they, all that the Lord had spoken, we will do. 
and we will be obedient. And then Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. So he's proposed his covenant. They've accepted. He's given them stipulations. They've recited the stipulations. It's been accepted. And then they are presented. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. He's presented with his bride, Israel. And they have a covenant meal to celebrate. It says, Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, and they ate and drank. We miss that sometimes. When we look at the Old Covenant, when we look at the Old Testament, we see the laws and where they come together and they present their sacrifice. They, they bring the firstborn and they present, prevent, present a sacrifice. And what we fail to remember is that then they were to sit down and eat it with the priests as a celebration of their covenant. Those festivals where they came and they gave their sacrifices were a celebration. And the thing is God invites us to do the same thing. God invites us to be his people. He invites us to dine in his presence. We celebrate it each Sunday. Two things I want to leave you with. As awesome as the events of Exodus were, as awesome as God's presence on Sinai was, they're inferior to the covenant we have in Jesus. The deliverance on the cross is greater. God's presence for us is greater. He poured out his spirit so that he could dwell among us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your story. Lord God, we thank you that you were leading us to the cross. That, Lord God, you have called your people to live in your presence throughout all time. That you've made provision. You made provision for Israel as they made their way from Egypt. Lord God, you made provision with the tabernacle. You made provision with the temple. And Lord God, when we messed that up, you made provision with your son. You sent him to dwell among us. And Lord God, when we messed that up, he gave himself to die on a cross for us. And Lord God, you made provision by your Holy Spirit and you dwell amongst us here today. Lord God, I pray that we grab hold of your covenant. We grab hold of your promise that is eternal. We grab hold of your loving kindness, that you seek us even when we grumble in the wilderness. The Lord God, for us, here and now, we can turn to you in a moment and in a blink of an eye, and that we can come into your presence. I thank you, Lord, that you invited us here today to fellowship and to celebrate our covenant before you. Lord God, I thank you that you've claimed each of us that the cross was for me, that the cross was for future generations. Lord God, make us your servants. Make us your hands and feet. As we wander in the wilderness, make us your voice. Help us to tell our children and our children's children. Help us to speak to the nations around us. Help us to make disciples. We thank you, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.